Hello and good evening. If you're joining us, I uh, wanted to welcome you all um, to this evening's uh, presentation of Bone on Bone Arthritis. Uh, and we're going to be talking about traditional versus orthobiologic treatment. Um, and thank you for, for taking time out of your uh, likely busy evenings. And uh, hopefully we're going to have some fun discussions about what is bone on bone? What do we do with that? What's the traditional pathway versus the orthobiologic orthobiologic treatment pathway. And so uh, I'm going to jump into it. I'm your host this evening, uh, Dr. Keely John Booth here in Oklahoma City, OrthoBiogen, uh, where we are the uh, state-of-the-art regenics provider for Oklahoma. And um, so we're going to jump into it. So thank you again. All right, just a little bit about me, uh, background. I am a uh, uh, born and bred Oklahoman, grew up here and attended University of Oklahoma in terms of uh, medical school, as well as my anesthesiology training, which a lot of people don't realize, interventional spine uh, treatment uh, really was um, largely invented by anesthesiologists. And um, so that was one of the very first procedures I learned to do were spine treatments, epidurals, and those things. So I've been doing this a while. I've, I'm now in my uh, 21st year of experience um, as a physician and uh, been doing guided procedures um, for uh, that long. So one of the first, uh, one of the other early procedures I learned to do was a uh, uh, ultrasound guided treatments, needle guidance. And so lots of experience in that. I don't know how many thousands of, of them I've done over the years, but quite a few. So we, we know our way around that, that treatment modality. And I really look forward to the opportunity to help those of you out there that are tuning in to really consider an alternative to surgery, which is that really that traditional pathway that's been presented. And a lot of people don't have the opportunity to really know uh, what else is out there. And that's why we're doing this um, on a regular basis. We do at least one webinar a month to help everyone kind of understand all the different areas that you may be able to find some opportunity for treatment um, out there. So, all right. So, what is bone on bone? And this is a common thing. I, I probably hear this word almost every single day. People routinely come in and tell me, well, doctor, you know, I, 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 mean, I may not be a candidate. What do you think may you, you can do for me? Maybe there's something out there that can help, maybe a stem cell treatment, maybe PRP, but they don't really have high hopes because they've been told that they've got this uh, very serious condition called bone on bone. Well, um, uh, I'm really here today to dispel a lot of myths about bone on bone, and it's kind of an interesting term, and I think it has a lot of connotations, and a lot of those are negative, and really, when people hear they have quote-unquote bone on bone, this uh, impact on their mentality and really even the expectations of, you know, they just kind of feel like that they're doomed to have surgery. Um, and that's unfortunate because uh, many times that is just not the case. All right. So um, so let's talk about bone on bone, the definition from a medical perspective. So number one, this term does not exist in a medical dictionary. A lot of you may be surprised to hear that. I'll say that again. So the term bone on bone doesn't exist in any medical dictionary. And I actually looked at about five or six uh, different medical dictionaries just to make sure that something hadn't been added um, since the time I was in medical school training and, you know, uh, even even recently. So, you know, think about that. Well, that means that maybe this is not a term that really has truly a definition or an agreed meaning, at least not enough to justify placing it in a, a textbook in a way that would allow uh, medical students and those training in medicine to actually learn about it. So, and, and, and here's another interesting point. So number two is out of the current 69,832 international classification of disease codes, which is in its 10th iteration, you can see there, we call it ICD-10 for short, out of the almost 70,000 codes, exactly zero, zero of those codes are dedicated to bone on bone. And you can find just about everything in those almost 70,000 codes and really remarkably specific with regards to what they 
uh, really uh, explain and what the diagnose. So, so that's interesting. So, so again, we don't have it in a dictionary. We don't have it in the ICD-10 codes. It's not a diagnosis that your doctor can even put into your chart because it doesn't exist. It's not an identifiable diagnosis. So that's again, interesting. And really then what is bone on bone? Bone on bone arthritis is a slang term used to label a patient with essentially severe arthritis in a very uh, non-clinical manner. And so, but it does bring to mind a very painful condition. It does bring to mind this concept of, boy, I, I don't have any cartilage left. And I, I, when patients come in and they tell me that they have bone on bone, I said, well, you know, so tell me, do you, you think you, you know, is there any cartilage left? And they say, well, I don't know. I've got bone on bone. So I tell them, hey, I'll make a bet with you. I'll show you some of your cartilage today. And I can usually do that in a matter of seconds to a minute or so. And I can identify that you, oh, look, you do have cartilage. And sometimes you have quite a lot of cartilage. Now, granted, it may have some damage. It may have some indentation there. But frankly, pretty rarely do you have true bone on bone disease, because if you did and you lose that cartilage surface, those bones will begin to fuse and connect on their own. So the challenge there is, is then why is that used? Well, what you find is I think a lot of times, you know, because we don't as physicians and I'll include myself in that, I always try to explain as much as I can, you know, but we well, sometimes, you know, uh, in this busy world of medicine, we run out of time for explanations. And a lot of times when you say bone on bone, that kind of feels like a dead end street, right? You just hit that dead end street. You're like, well, it's bone on bone. You got to have surgery and that's it. Um, and so it does shut down a lot of discussion. And I think a lot of it's because it, it it's, it, it's a problem for people in terms of understanding you know, what that even means. And they feel like, hey, they got there, dead end street, I've got to have surgery. And you just kind of accept it. But I'm really here to dispel that myth this evening. Okay. All right. So let's talk about stages of arthritis. Okay. We've got essentially four primary stages. And so we call these KL grades, you'll hear lots of different terminology, but I don't want to get too specific or too technical this evening. Uh, but suffice it to say that there's different stages of disease. And notice exactly zero of these talk about bone on bone. Uh, and that's because it's just a really oversimplified way, even if, it, if that were true, um, you know, virtually no one's gonna have every bone in contact with every other bone. And as you can see here, these grades, uh, when we go through here, I'm gonna get on my laser pointer here. And uh, so you can see here in stage one, you have very minimal disease. There's not much in the way of joint surface. And these are, of course, car cartoon drawings. And I'll show you some actual uh, information here um, in just a moment, but um, our actual images, I should say, some diagnostics. But you can see here, as this goes along, you're getting relatively more severe, more damage. But really, at no point, even when we describe this uh, as clinicians, do we anticipate that there's zero cartilage just really doesn't happen. And you can see even here at this most severe, you know, they talk about a 60% of the cartilage is already lost. And, and really even that, that's relatively rare to see 60%. If I were going to measure the true surface area of the joint, uh, not typical, but we do see a lot of osteophytes, which is just a fancy word for bone spurs for those of you out there. And so, um, you know, we, we see that. And of course, meniscus tears, which um, we're going to be doing another webinar on meniscus tearing, but you'll hear a little bit of those things, a uh, few of those things mentioned, you know, um, um, throughout and happy to answer some questions about that. But commonly, osteoarthritis coexists with meniscus tears, and most of those meniscus tears that you're suffering from would be uh, degenerative instead of traumatic. And how to treat them is actually, I, I used to say it's controversial, but it's actually not anymore. Uh, and I'll explain more later. All right. So, jumping into some actual pictures. And so here we see this is an x-ray and this is actually a fluoroscopic image. And I was using this to demonstrate, um, you know, what's going on uh, with uh, arthritis. And as you can see here, I have uh, a patient with not much space here. Okay. And you can see de decreased here, but then over here, you can see, oh boy, I've got 
you know, some a good amount of space in, in between those joints. So, you know, does this patient on the on the right image have bone on bone? Um, and then this patient is is looks pretty normal. Well, this is actually a trick question. This is the same patient. This is actually one of the members of my medical staff who I took images of uh, this week in order to show what happens sometimes when you take a picture at the wrong angle through the joint. So, and, and think about that. This joint and this joint are in fact the same joint. And matter of fact, just to really kind of mix it up, I flip the images. This is not right and left. It's actually uh, a right uh, knee. And uh, we've just flipped it to make it look like it was uh, a left there. So, uh, but, and, and then here, this is a slightly tilted angle of the x-ray. So depending on what the technician does, the technician themselves can actually show you something that might look like quote unquote bone on bone. And think about that, just a few degrees of tilt, right? can make you believe that you have that. So this is where I argue, and, and I'll tell you, no Regenix physician uh, in the world, we're international, we have clinics all over, uh, uh, India, China, uh, England, I mean, uh, you, you name it. But, you know, none of those Regenix physicians would use, in isolation, a knee x-ray to diagnose. And I can't tell you how often I see that the decision for surgery is based on a single x-ray and the surgeon's not even in the room when that image was taken. So they're not sure the circumstances under which you took that image. And, and you can get fooled as I did here. I kind of fooled everybody with this, this concept of, and again, this patient absolutely does not need surgery at all. And, but here, hmm, I'm not sure about this one, right? So that kind of illustrates that. All right. So now here's another uh, uh, patient that uh, you know I, um, that I had, and so you can see here. Uh, oh boy, this this uh, right side here is looking um, like they may have a little bit of loss of space here. Okay, so again, I did this to show what this looks like for normal, and boy, this looks like these two bones might be touching. Once again, same patient, a different staff member, just to prove the point. And, and I left this uh, mirror image here so you can see where I mirrored it. This is literally the same image. This picture is just taken at a slightly different angle. And I want to warn those of you out there that have looked at amniotic products, quote unquote, uh, fetal stem cell procedures, those things, these same images are used in reverse in order to take a picture sometimes to show an effect that maybe did not occur um, and, and most of the time does not occur. Um, they'll actually start with a bad angle and say, oh, this is your knee. And then when they take the image, they show it like this and go, oh, well, look, you've got more cartilage there. This is the same patient. This image was taken seconds apart. There is no difference between these two knees. The only difference is the angle at which the x-ray was taken. And that is just a critical point. That's why I took both of these pictures, did it on two different patients to really drive home. In our opinion, uh, at Regenix and at Orthobiogen and, and me as a clinician, if you truly want to identify what your diagnosis is and what your opportunity for treatment is, this, a simple x-ray is not enough to make that judgment. All right. So now we're moving on to some ultrasound images. And this really gets into something unique that you do see with Regenix physicians, orthobiologic specialists. We really dig in deeply. And this is um, a, a patient that actually has uh, some very um, mild early stage osteoarthritis. And I wanted to point out how clearly we can see that change and some thinning. Uh, and then in this image, you actually see some bone spurring. You actually see where that peaks up there. And so that bone's under a little stress. So it's responding to that stress. In addition, this is the quadricep tendon. And we can actually see out here laterally that the patient has a pocket of fluid. Okay, this is well beyond normal physiologic fluid levels, but uh, uh, but if your local orthopedic surgeon or primary care doctor tries to drain this joint, they're probably not going to get much out. And uh, but in fact, that 
fluid is in there because and we can actually drain that under direct guidance with ultrasound. And here's another image uh, looking uh, essentially what we call sagittally in, in the long axis here on this quadricep tendon. You can see again this fluid. So this is beyond physiologic. This patient has very early stage, but this is the level of disease that we can really begin to understand. And just to point out, this is only four images out of approximately 30 images that I would take of a, a, a person's knee, whereas in a typical x-ray, you're going to get, you know, two, maybe three different images. So I really, and the other advantage I have is I get to see your knee move. Okay. And I get to see it change relative to um, when you're moving it, where it hurts, I get to palpate it. And so it's an entirely different thing. And I do that myself during my Regenix consults. So you'll be hearing from the expert directly as opposed to, you know, I'm just taking someone else's pictures. All right. So, um, and just for those of you that wonder what does a normal knee look like, this knee is pretty darn normal. Uh, so this, this one actually has a nice clean cartilage all the way across. You see how nice and smooth that is. You can see that bone. So again, this is where I say it can come in and I can show you pictures of your cartilage on the day of our visit. So, um, so that's very helpful. So uh, yeah, th this one's a nice normal picture. All right, so moving on. Okay, so what does abnormal look like? And we get into here some MRI images. So here's a pretty dramatic difference you can see on this, uh, what we would call a coronal image of this MRI. And we essentially look at this area here and we say, okay, this is where the meniscus lives in between the bones. But I do see some bone spurring here. It's pretty significant. And then out here, so we see this uh, white area here. This isn't good. We've got some fluid buildup, and I even see some fluid buildup out here. And then when I look at that in a sagittal or a long axis view, we can actually see quite a lot of fluid here. So I know that this knee is, is um, you know, very uh, angry, and we would see a lot of fluid uh, on, on ultrasound with this one. The other thing to pick up on is this uh, area of bony change here. This area of white change here, what we call a bone marrow lesion, is important. This bone supports the cartilage surface. And so if this bone isn't functioning properly, it can't take care of the cartilage. And this cartilage will begin to fail at a much faster rate because you can no longer really support it. The other thing to notice is that, and you can see this yellow line shows us where we're at, we've lost uh, a lot of this meniscus is essentially gone. And so we don't really have that. Uh, bony uh, padding between the bones, I should say. And so this bone here is just going to be pushing in, and this is where you get a lot of pressure. So um, so that's helpful. And this, and this is really meant to demonstrate why diagnostic images beyond x-ray are so important. You can see using all of these images and modalities together gives us a fundamentally different appreciation. And, you know, and if you're just going to go in and cut the knee joint out anyway, you really don't care about all these, the nuance that we're going through here. It's like, well, there's fluid in there. Yeah, well, we're just going to go cut the knee joint out. And so that's a big reason the surgeons never really spend the time on these things and don't spend the time thinking about how can we help this knee non-surgically? They spent their whole, whole lives training, you know, to cut that knee out, uh, to cut that joint out. Um, but uh, in our office, I've spent my career, you know, essentially uh, trying to help you not do that. So, uh, and here again, this is a different patient. Um, and then we've got some bony changes here. You can see some early, uh, you know, some chondrosis here. And so you'll, you'll see that on reported on your MRIs and you can see again, that white space and you're, you've lost a lot of that meniscus, you know, in that area. So again, shows you some of those, those bony changes. So just to give you an idea about the level of specificity that we go to. So, so here just on a broader scale, why orthobiogen? So, you know, we are Oklahoma's exclusive Regenix provider. So uh, we're the only place that you can get the highest level of regenerative treatment being offered, uh, the most advanced non-surgical procedures that are backed by uh, data. Uh, we've performed as a network approximately 150,000 procedures across our regenerative network. Um, we have data behind it. We have um, a patient registry. Uh, you know, state-of-the-art interventional spine treatment facilities. We have the most advanced outpatient treatment facility built in Oklahoma. We engineered that facility from the ground up. 
Uh, everything has a purpose, has a reason for being, and we have unique facilities that there's really nothing like what we do here. Um, uh, and of course, board certification, I think is important. It shows a commitment to our uh, uh, craft and what we're doing overall. So, uh, and then several other reasons that you can see here, precision digital guidance, um, whether it's ultrasound or fluoroscopy, we're experts in both techniques. I routinely use both of those imaging techniques in my procedures to ensure that we have the accuracy necessary to deliver the highest quality of care. All right. So, uh, and then this is, uh, you know, the, our, our clinic that we launched last year, we're officially one year old um, this month. So that's exciting. And so uh, really provide an outstanding care experience. We routinely hear that from patients that, wow, this is so different than anything they've ever experienced before. So, so we invite you to come down and join us and, and, and have that experience as a patient. Um, you know, and we talked about us being the exclusive provider of Regenics and, uh, you know, and this is actually, you can see here, this is our image, our, uh, excuse me, our tissue processing lab. And so this area is totally unique. There's not a room like this in the state of Oklahoma that does what we do in that room. This allows us to provide the highest level of PRP preparation being performed in Oklahoma, period. Beyond that, we measure your tissue content. We measure for platelets. We measure that in your blood. That's how we know where we're trying to get to. And so we get into you know, this concept of what's the importance of PRP dosing. You know, we, we ran studies on the best out there that, that is available in the state and really no one comes close. Um, one of the fundamental things you have to do with PRP treatment is get the platelet counts to where you need them to be. 10 billion platelets is crucial for treating a knee, for example, in terms of your PRP formulation as this study reported. And this is widely known among specialists not well known among amateurs who are out there maybe advertising on the radio. Uh, you know, you may see digital ads that talk about, hey, regenerative care. If they cannot tell you how they're going to get you 10 billion platelets, they are not specialists in this area and they don't understand the importance. And most likely, they're not even able to get to 10 billion platelets. And that's what we find. So we, we know of no other clinic in the state of Oklahoma that actually even has the capacity or willingness to count your playlist to figure out how to get to 10 billion. It's critical to your outcome. All right. So uh, we talk about, you know, concierge care. And, and of course, uh, you know, we, we want you to be comfortable and, and understand and have an opportunity to feel at ease when we're educating you about your condition. So um, unparalleled in terms of, of what we provide uh, from the entire care experience, from evaluation, whether you're a candidate or not, we want you to come and have that opportunity for patient education. And so um, uh, we'll, and then uh, as I mentioned, state-of-the-art facilities, this is um, the most advanced outpatient facility. We can see here our digital fluoroscopy machine, uh, machine there. We have uh, the opportunity to do full anesthesia here. Um, and uh, our patients really brag about us in terms of how well they're cared for when they come um, for treatment with us. All right. And then mentioned board certification previously. So physician treatment is, is what you'll get here. You're never going, no one but a board certified doctor trained in Regenics will ever perform your procedure at a Regenics clinic. And that goes for anywhere in the world. So, um, so, and then one of the questions I have that's coming up, uh, we've already got those coming in is about how long does it take to see an improvement after the procedure? Well, I, and this is an area where I always like to say that I'll, I, I prefer to under-promise and over-deliver, but I will tell you that we do have patients as soon as uh, one to two weeks already begin to report improvement, but that's not as exciting as what I hear at three months, six months, when patients are saying, hey, Dr. Booth, I couldn't hike you know, uh, the trails that I, you know, grew to love and really had problems with my knees and I couldn't make it. And, and now I'm able to do that and I don't have to stop and I can go for miles. And those are the kind of reports that we get from patients pretty routinely uh, in terms of, you know, if you're a candidate for the procedure and we do that, uh, for example, our SD procedures, which are bone marrow based, um, they uh, include stem cells within that bone marrow. And we do those treatments, we're able to get patients well down the road 
um, in terms of their recovery. And it doesn't take very long. The key is too, recovery time is so much less than surgery that people are back doing the activities they love, back at work much more uh, quickly. So hope that answers your question. Um, and how long does it last? So in terms of the procedures, you know, when we look at um, how that plays out, you know, we there have been studies within Regenix using our patient registry to isolate how do patients do. And typically, most of the patients are getting a single treatment, a single bone marrow treatment. But through the patented process used by Regenix, including both a pre-injection and a post-injection procedure, it's all included in our standard SD uh, knee treatments. Um, those procedures typically last patients in terms of years, not, not weeks or months, like you see with a, a steroid injection, but we typically are getting years of improvement. And literally we're finding patients with changes on their MRI that are improvements that are actually demonstrable. And so there's multiple um, reports out there and you can see, you can log on to um, regenix.com. There's lots of information. Um, Dr. Centeno uh, routinely does blogs and talks about cases, and we have cases that get reported routinely on social media that really show you the value of, of what we can do. And so, uh, but typically we're, we're getting uh, years for a lot of patients. So, all right. So if you've had a recent heart surgery, um, can you have this procedure? Yes, absolutely. And, and the question is, you know, we have to define recent. We work with your cardiologist and with your uh surgical team, your team of doctors to identify and prepare you as you would have for any uh, procedure in orthopedics. And so matter of fact, my experience is so deep in this area, I used to actually develop and set up preoperative assessment clinics early in my career to help prepare patients for uh, surgeries and, and procedures under anesthesia. So, and, and believe it or not, the anesthesia risk is actually the higher risk uh, when you have those, those procedures um, you know, looking at a minimally invasive approach. So, um, so we do all the proper checks and we work on that. So we would be working with your cardiologist to help you. And matter of fact, many patients who are not candidates for surgery because of their surgical risk may actually be candidates for what we do. And your cardiologist may actually prefer that you have the procedure that we offer. All right. So, and is there an age cutoff for the procedure? Uh, no, there's not. I've personally treated patients that are almost 90 years old with this procedure and had benefit. Um, I haven't yet uh, had the opportunity to treat someone that's uh, uh, 100, but I hope to do that uh, someday. And people say, well, aren't my cells, aren't my stem cells, isn't my PRP or my blood, isn't, am I too old to get any benefit? And my comment to them is, well, that depends. If, if you cut yourself and you have an injury, do you heal that injury? And, you know, almost universally, they say, yeah, I, I do. I, I, I heal those, those injuries and, and those scrapes and scuffs, you know, we are pretty routinely. Well, that means that you have the power of healing within you and you have cells and platelets and growth factors that absolutely are active and that can give you some benefit. Now, there are occasions where if your disease state is too progressed, we may recommend a cultured stem cell procedure and actually go down uh, to the Cayman Islands, for example, where we are able to actually culture stem cells and expand them into the many millions, tens of millions of cells and use that to treat more advanced disease. Or if we think that there may, you may be on that edge of where we would recommend that, you know, based on age, health, or some other reason. And so, um, and, and just as a preview for those of you out there that are wondering, uh, I am working with the Cayman team. I uh, met with them last week, and we're going to see about going down and doing some treatments uh, uh, for patients in the Cayman Islands here uh, in the near future. So that may be something on the horizon that you'll you'll see us down there. And if we are, we'll we'll make a point to to uh, blog or or do a webinar from the Caymans. That'll be that'd be fun probably from the beach, ideally, right? <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. So the question is, uh, let's see, I have received stem cell therapy and PRP treatment one year ago in Tulsa. Should I require additional PRP treatment to maintain my current status? That depends, right? That depends on what was your original diagnosis? What was the severity of your disease? What was the treatment that you underwent? And there really isn't a 
blanket recipe out there, right? That says you must have PRP at this date. Um, I would uh, say, let's take a look, let's evaluate, see where you are. But if you're suffering, you're noticing some swelling, you're noticing a little more pain, things are starting to creep back in there. That might That's a good tip off to tell you that maybe you need to jump in there and, and take a look because you want to get that uh, get ahead of that right before it starts going south. And I'm happy to help you, even for those of you that maybe we didn't treat in our clinic, I'm happy to evaluate you and tell you what we would have done. Um, and so uh, just, I, I, at least I know it wasn't a Regenix procedure if you did that in Tulsa uh, within the last, uh, gosh, probably five, six years, uh, because there hasn't been any opportunity to have that treatment there. But um, we're happy to take a look and help you. Um, so the real question is, how are you doing? And so um, we really try to be good stewards of your resources. We're not just going to bring you in just because, right? Um, you know, we want to have a good rationale for treatment. And it really gets down to your individual circumstance, your individual diagnosis. So, all right. So we're going to move on to the second portion of the presentation where we're going to talk more about, well, what do the traditional guys do? We talked a little bit about what we do, about how we get the high uh, yield in terms of platelets and the state-of-the-art facilities that we use. But what do you see on the flip side? All right. So the first knee replacement surgery was performed uh, in about 1968. Okay. That's according to uh, several different resources, one of which um, I've listed here if you wanted to, to check that out. So um, so really, um, it's been around, you know, for for a little bit. So we, we're 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 over fifty years now in the knee replacement territory, and at that time, you had very little options, right? So uh, traditional approach, you know, um, you're watching television with your loved ones, and you basically uh, look at that and say, "Hey, you know what? I think I'm having a little knee pain." So um, and so, what do you do? Well. You hop on over to the to the communication modality of the time, right? And uh, uh, it's hard to. Uh, uh, it's funny when I show this picture to my kids, and they had no idea. They're like, well, and I, I literally asked one of my kids uh, and they, when they were eight years old, and I said, "Hey, do you do you know what this is?" And and they said, "Yeah, I know what that is." They and and they said, "It's a a time machine." And so, well, apparently they had been watching Doctor Who. So, so, every, so a lot of the younger generation has no idea what what happens in that booth, and they think it's a time machine. So I thought that was great. But, uh, uh, but, but the idea is is that this kind of shows you how long right ago that this thought process came out about what we're going to do is go you know in there, and so uh, and say, hey, what are we going to do with this? So you talk to your doctor and. You know, their concern is, hey, you're, they're afraid that you've got arthritis. Well, you know, tell you, you know, that's, you kind of knew that going in, that that might be a thing. And so, well, then what do they do next? Well, all too often, it's a one-way street. And that's where I have a lot of challenges uh, with my colleagues is, hey, we've got to, you know, don't, don't use these old-fashioned modalities. And you really got to think about it because... I have yet to meet a patient that walks into my office and after having surgery, after having been evaluated uh, by surgeon very often before I get a chance to talk with them. And I say, well, why did you go see a surgeon if you don't want surgery? And they said, well, that's where my doctor sent me. And so that is still, unfortunately, right now, that is what happens. And even the surgeons themselves, I have many surgeon friends, I, I beat up on them uh, sometimes, but I, I love them. And, and when you need them, you want to have a good one. And, and I can tell you uh, from personal experience, but, you know, the surgeons themselves complain about the referrals that they get from the primary care doctors, because the surgeons is literally sifting their population of patients to see who actually needs them. Even an aggressive surgeon is turning down people because they're like, hey, I can't even justify operating on this patient, right? And so, and that happens every day. And, and my question is always, who do you think's better at helping you not have surgeon? Someone who spent their entire career focusing on offering you a surgery-free way to address your condition or a surgeon who really has spent their entire life perfecting surgery, right? It's an inherent bias that's built in that really... And there's no negative there. It's just, that's the way it is. All right. So, so then the question becomes, you know, to surgeon or not to surgeon, I would say if you're new onset pain or even repeat 
uh, onset pain from treatments that your primary care doctors has provided. I think you really, in this day and age, you owe it to yourself to contemplate what else is out there. All right. So a um, couple of key facts I'm going to run through. So poor utilization of non-surgical options is an absolute fact. When it's This is actually uh, information that came out in the JAMA Health Forum, okay, um, 2022. And this was a study where they looked at an uh, entire group of surgeons um, across, uh, I mean, it was, it, it was in the hundreds. And so they actually ran this data and said, okay, how many patients had at least one session, one visit uh, in uh, physical therapy prior to an elective hip or knee replacement surgery? Uh, and, and, they're, and here they're indicating that, look, this is virtually always clinically indicated to have that done. But even in the best performing group, which is quintile one is the way they labeled it, the best performing group of orthopedic surgeons, the range was one in five patients, okay, to two out of three patients. That was the range. That's a huge range. That tells you the statistical variation among the best surgeons is one in five times to two out of three times they sent you to physical therapy. Here's what's scary. That's the best performing. And there were five quintiles. The lowest quintile, okay, was four out of 100 patients, okay, or one out of eight patients. That's how little they used therapy prior to surgery. That's that's shocking to me. I, I, I actually, my mouth dropped open when I read that because this is this is fascinating to hear this. And this is, you know, new data. This is the latest information. It has been settled that we really should try some non-surgical opportunities before we take you to surgery. And in in virtually any surgeon I've work with uh, and would work with would agree that that'd be a good option. Um, and so, you know, think about that. Now, part of it is they're going to say, well, this patients don't go to physical therapy and they say, or they say it didn't work when they tried it. I get it, but we owe it to patients to really help them understand why it might be a good option. Okay. And I personally, even before doing an orthobiologic procedure, I have sent patients to therapy uh, in certain instances where we'd say, hey, you need to do this first because I'm not even sure you need an orthobiologic procedure. Okay. All right. So the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, you know, uh, this is helpful to understand that when surgery is recommended, when is surgery recommended? There's a lot of key words in here, severe. Okay. Uh, moderate to severe pain while resting. Okay. I see patients routinely that have no pain at rest and were recommended knee replacement uh, because you know, when they, when they jog, you know, or, or, or get too active or, you know, uh, hike, uh, you know, several miles, they have pain. I'm like, well, well, gosh, that doesn't sound like, you know, this recommendation. So, so look at that and, you know, need deformities, these things, these are actually, uh, much more rare, uh, for the patients that, that I see, they, you know, when you start having bowing and things, it's immediately evident. So, um, that can be indicative of a much worse, situation, but we're happy to help you. Some people just have, um, you know, leg bowing. I was born with it. I was uh, just, you know, that's just one of the things that you, that you have uh, sometimes. So you may have started life that way. All right. So, um, so basically, and then they talk about failure to substantially improve with other surgeries. Well, what other surgeries really what they're talking about here and they don't say it is, well, you know, your what, what I call, some people call, um, um, meniscectomies, uh, you know, and knee scopes, I call it, you know, uh, pre knee replacement surgery, because I'll show you in a minute why, why, why that is. All right. So, so a couple things I think it's important to understand. This is the prediction of not knee replacements. Okay. But revision knee replacements. So this is where we're at now. We're pushing close to 200,000 revision knee placements every year. Why is that important? Because every risk for knee replacement dramatically increases when you have a revision knee replacement. Now look at this number, right? And extrapolate 10 years, 20 years at, the re at what they're expecting and look at knee versus hip. What accounts for that difference? Well, it's because something that we've seen, 
knee replacements are far more complex and just frankly don't do as well as hip replacements. So that is a that is just a known thing among people that both the the surgeons that perform these procedures as well as the orthobiologic doctors, we all know that uh, that's kind of the way it goes. And so, um, you know, knees are just much tougher. So you really have to contemplate that. The type of joint replacement you get is critical to predicting the outcome. And so, and the numbers are even more challenging when you look at um, shoulder joint replacements. All right. So a um, couple other quick stats. We look back here from 1975, um, the rate of increase, okay? Now understand that this is a rate of increase, meaning that the frequency is going up dramatically. Here, we're about 10 surgeries per 10,000 population. And we're approaching here, and this is old data, but it's one of the best charts I could find to show the relative trajectory. And this trajectory is about on this slope and it goes, it's going off the chart now. So now we're getting up to this area where we're about a hundred per 10,000. And so, and it continues to go up. All right. So, so it's on the rise um, uh, to be sure. Knee arthroscopy for knee osteoarthritis. We talked about this, touched on it earlier. So, uh, and I just want, I just want to read this because it's, it's pretty striking when you, when you look at this, this is not my quote. This is from a research paper that was published uh, again from the, the JAMA network of publications. Um, so although there have been multiple randomized clinical trials showing no efficacy, again, no, meaning no significant improvement of knee arthroscopy for knee osteoarthritis or debridement of partial degenerative menisci, which is what most people have when they tell you have a, a meniscus tear, we are still studying these treatments, perhaps searching for a different outcome. Now, this is tongue in cheek by, excuse me there, I'll jump back. So this is tongue in cheek by the author saying, look, this debate is over. And we've known for 20 years since the original research on this topic came out that we should not be doing knee scopes and debridements of, of the meniscus uh, for patients that have primarily, you know, osteoarthritis. And they've even gone so far as to say, oh, well, there are certain cases, you know, that's what was claimed sometimes by the surgical um, providers. They'll say, hey, we know who, who will benefit and who won't. Well, that study has been done also. And uh, what they found is regardless of experience level, they looked at uh, 194 surgeons and they let them predict what was going to be the outcome for these patients that had already had the treatments. And they said, which of these patients is going to improve? Their odds of success in predicting who was benefiting and who would not from surgery was no better than the flip of a coin. Imagine that. So uh, that, that tells us something. So no better than mere chance as to whether or not they were going to improve or not. So, so this is a big area of, of controversy. Unfortunately, um, we're talking about uh, uh, 700,000 procedures uh, roughly on an annual basis in the United States alone every year. And by the way, all covered under insurance for the most part, including Medicare and major carriers, which is shocking. So, all right. So couple of things I wanted to touch on. We have a lack of head-to-head -head comparisons. And when I say that, a lack of head-to-head -head comparisons, there's virtually no head-to-head -head comparisons of knee replacement, for example, and comparing that against a orthobiologic regenerative treatment. And, and really, there's a lack of head-to-head -head comparisons uh, comparing knee replacement to routine non-surgical treatment. And that's what this is. So exercise, education, dietary advice, um, use of insoles, analgesics, meaning just over the counter. Um, these areas are basically um, helping you understand that essentially, you know, this is was only done one time. There was one study done in 2015 that actually compared surgery to non-surgery. And that's shocking. So, uh, but it, it seems that that maybe uh, that they're not interested in doing that study. And so, and there's a couple of other things that were found by this study. Um, you know, one being uh, go figure. You know, the relative risk of severe complication was far higher in those that had surgery. Okay. Now I'm going to run through a couple of these uh, items here. So traditional approaches. Um, you know, in patients with knee osteoarthritis. Uh, a knee scope surgery with men meniscectomy um, 
gave you a 300% increased risk for future knee replacement. So not only do we know that that surgery doesn't work for patients with osteoarthritis and degenerative meniscus tears, it actually makes you more likely to need a knee replacement. So, so again, uh, why are we doing that? All right. So then, uh, you know, so that's what the traditional approach looks like, um, you know, so uh, kind of a rough image there, but that's, that's what it comes down to. So a couple of quick things, uh, quick facts that you won't hear typically before you, before you sign up for surgery is, and I think these are important things. This is all based on the modern reported uh, literature uh, for orthopedics. So I've updated these numbers um, to the better numbers because they have gotten better with the relative risk, but uh, still, you know, let you decide, uh, you, you know, do you, do you want to just run to surgery before you consider your alternatives? So one in three rate of dissatisfaction with surgery, it's as high as one in three patients are not happy after knee replacement, which is, that's, that's pretty rough. So one in five rate of chronic pain after surgery, meaning no matter how the joint works, it could work great. It could look like a textbook replacement, but you still may have pain 20% of the time for the rest of your life. Um, one in five rate of complications, a one in 20 rate of a serious complication. And that's where you get into blood clots and other other things that you have to think about. Um, a one in 100 rate of infection. Some publications rate it higher than that. I've seen it as 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 uh, uh, frequent as one in 50. So it just depends on the resource. So I gave them the benefit of the doubt here, you know, one in 100. But still, uh, that's that's a lot if it's if it's you that gets that infection. And so one in four to 500 rate of mortality in 90 days, that's the one that's kind of the shocker. So, um, so my question is, what are you going to do in the next 90 days that puts you in this classification of having a one in 400 to a one in 500 chance of, and, and guys, you know, mortality is just a, a fancy medical word for death. Okay. That's what that number means. So one in 400 to one in 500 of people who merely have this surgery will not be with us in 90 days. Um, and I know we ran some statistics on this. Hang gliding is a lower risk. Hang gliding was one in 2000 risk of mortality. So just just, just to put that in perspective, okay? Uh, um, a lot of people ask about, what about scuba diving? Scuba diving, last I pulled those numbers, was one in a million. So you're actually dramatically safer scuba diving than you are doing this. So, all right. So then again, I ask you, you know, is it to surgery or not to surgery? And you see here, we've got a, a good repeat customer here uh, on the surgical side. And uh, these things have a way of leading, you know, into the next one. And so it kind of, kind of makes you wonder. So, all right. So, um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and talk about questions uh, with you guys. And we'll have, uh, let's see, Amanda's helping me. So, all right. So in your evaluation, do you require fresh standing x-rays and or MRIs. So if by fresh, uh, um, you know, uh, you mean uh, recent, I would say we certainly wouldn't turn them down. So, 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 uh, and we do want recent imaging and MRIs. So, so I myself, depending on the pathology that you have and how serious your condition, I will require you to have an MRI within the last 12 months. Uh, and then if your symptoms have been changing or you've been rapidly progressing, I would get one sooner than that. And I would add something to that as well. You will always get an ultrasound with your evaluation as well. So we use all three of those major imaging modalities. We use uh, x-ray, uh, we use MRI, and we also use ultrasound. Sometimes the, the damage is so far past x-ray that we just kind of, you know, we blow through that one pretty quick. Uh, and remember, when I'm doing your procedure, I'm using x-ray as well. So that is a, a part of uh, the advantage. And, and then we also use ultrasound. So, all right. If my knee is stage four, not bone on bone, would you typically use a PRP or a stem cell procedure? All right. So so this gets into now, um, you know, predicting. Without having the specific patient here, I would not want to answer that definitively. But I will tell you, we would almost always use a cell-based treatment for a stage four patient. And the reason is because the data that we have out there on our patients, the many thousands, I, I, I pulled that information today and I, uh, Amanda, you might want to confirm that for me. Um, we are um, uh, well over 10,000. I think we're approaching 12,000 knees in our patient registry. And that's just knees. 
for what we call the SD or same day uh, Regenix uh, knee procedure where we're using bone marrow. But I'll tell you for a stage four, we were almost always going to recommend using uh, bone marrow. Now, if it's even more advanced stage four, because again, not all stage fours are created equal. You might see one little area of stage four and the radiologist call that out. But then on the other side, you say, well, all in all, you know, if you've got that small spot, maybe uh, you don't need that. But an advanced stage four, we may even want to contemplate um, talking about, you know, the Cayman Islands and doing the cultured uh, cells. Okay. All right. So, um, oh, we're actually up to 16,238 on the knees. So I was way off, but I, I I don't mind being lower than what it actually is. So yeah, we're, we have currently 16, over 16,000 knees. All right. So um, how many patients do you see that are not candidates. Now that's difficult because it depends on the joints and where you're at. So uh, just as an example, maybe, a, maybe uh, just to give you an idea, if you came in with a stage four hip uh, arthritis and, and that one is, is pretty severe, you know, then that's going to be lower likelihood for candidacy. Okay. But if you came in in a stage two or even a three, a lot of times we, we can help patients uh, uh, with that. And you typically, by the time I see patients with a hip arthritis, many times they are just more advanced because that joint seems to deteriorate at a rate that's much faster than the other uh, major joints. So, so that's one. But on the knee side, I would say, you know, we probably run in the neighborhood of, of 10%, maybe 15% ish uh, of patients that I would say, you know, we're, we're too far gone. And I, and, and, and again, that's a, that's a guess off the cuff, but, uh, I'll tell you, uh, a month does not go by without me saying, Hey, I, you know, think this is too advanced, uh, for, for that, uh, for this type of a treatment. And I'd recommend, you know, you really contemplate, you know, what your other options are, even, you know, including surgery. So, all right. So you've talked about PRP procedure. Do you do adult stem cell? For OA, yes. So, so and let me explain here. Stem cells are a natural part of what is in your own bone marrow, in your own tissue. Now, they're inherently adult because yeah, they they're coming from you. It's really important to understand that we do not use foreign tissue in our clinic. There are a lot of clinics out there advertising fetal stem cells and these other things, and it's important to understand that that comes with significant potential risk. There are documented cases across the United States of infections occurring. And to date, no lab, no independent lab has isolated stem cells from any of those uh, players out there that are selling quote unquote fetal stem cells. And so you really have to think about that. And, and we're happy to educate you, you know, more about that when we talk, but we absolutely use quote unquote stem cells as a part of your bone marrow. All right. So, all right. So you were talking about PRP. I thought you provided an MSC. Yeah. So mesenchymal stem cells is a portion of your bone marrow. Okay. And we really have two flavors at Regenix where we can get to that. One is we use your, your bone marrow, those live cells. And we actually measure the viability of those cells. We know how many nucleated cells we're collecting so that we can actually get to that therapeutic dosage that we've been able to figure out through our patient registry and having performed many, many tens of thousands of procedures as a network. But then you also have cultured MSCs where we take that in the Cayman Islands and you're able to culture, expand that and have only mesenchymal stem cells. So you can actually have them grow out to be tens of millions of cells. And again, not always necessary and obviously more expensive to do that because you've got to, you know, that culturing process is quite technical. But when you get over onto that side of things, you typically have pretty advanced disease or you want to treat multiple areas all at once. Okay. All right. So in general, uh, let's see here. Does your clinic perform genicular artery embolization? All right. So that's an interesting question because um, you do not want to embolize a genicular artery. Um, matter of fact, that would be considered a complication of a radiofrequency ablation. Or, uh, and so those types of procedures, right, are, are geared towards just pain relief, not functional improvement. 
And so um, I think there may have been some confusion about that in terms of what they're doing when they perform a genicular treatment. But yeah, a, to, to embolize the genicular arteries could actually cause some damage to the tissue because that means the tissue past that artery is is you know not going to get as much blood flow as it may like so so i think there may have been confusion on that um, but in orthobiogen we don't uh, do genicular ablation procedures um, so all right so in general how much does does the procedure cost this varies widely because uh, as i explain it to patients imagine that you came and you had um, a custom outfit you know made for you right it's tailored to you very specifically but if you wanted a, you know, a bathing suit, I don't need as much material, right? If you want a full three-piece suit, we need more material and, and it's probably gonna take a lot more effort to put that together. So, so maybe a bad analogy, but the idea is basically to get in there and say, what do you need? How can I help you being a good steward of, of your resources, but also uh, essentially meeting your needs in a very customized fashion? So unfortunately, I'm not able to say that just a blanket pricing, but I can assure you that we don't charge for things that you don't get. All right, so then we also have some financing options. So care credit, uh, it, we're a partner with them. And so we do have patients that, that take an advantage and they even have um, some methodologies to um, decrease uh, the cost and some, um, they run uh, certain um, things where they're basically interest-free for a certain amount of time. So that's a nice option for you. Uh, and you certainly consider that. And we we are happy to to work with, with patients on that. All right. So I am uh, the candidate uh, that told you I had a stem cell injection in Tulsa uh, by another pain center. I won't name them specifically, but in, and it says week four, I received the PRP booster from my own blood. Week six, I got laser visits. Week 12, final PRP, returned after a year. Another actually was taken to show me that the cartilage had been regenerated. Okay, so let me stop there. And I want to point out that if that's the case, you're the doctor, if it was a doctor that did your case, I, I'm not sure if it was, I really think that that doctor, Juan, should write a paper and publish it because he will be famous in the United States if he was able to actually achieve that, literally famous. And matter of fact, I would meet him, uh, drive to Tulsa, take him to dinner, and I would uh, you know, wait with bated breath uh, about everything that he did to help you. Because to our knowledge, there is no evidence that, that you could achieve that kind of result with that therapy that quickly so I wonder, right? And so, so call me, you know, how about, um, you know, I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying I'm skeptical. <laughs> so, so that is, that is tough. And again, I showed you literally in the beginning of the uh, presentation, how easy it is for me to show you a different angle of the joint of someone that has no arthritis. I mean, completely healthy. And I can make that patient look as though they do have arthritis in their knee merely by changing the angle. And sometimes I'm, you know, the doctor may not be in control of the angle. He's just given that by the tech, which is exactly why at Regenix we perform the physicians who do your procedures, perform the diagnostic imaging and go over your images directly with you, such as MRI and those things. All right. So, all right. So for uh, osteoarthritis, the procedure involves MSC with the addition of PRP. Uh, how about this? We always use PRP in conjunction with a cell-based treatment. And the reason is because you need those growth factors to help support those cells and it helps them last longer and produce better results. And I wanna make another distinction. We don't only use PRP, we use something called platelet lysate, which is an entirely different formulation. And we're the only clinic in the state of Oklahoma that actually really even knows how to make platelet lysate which think of platelet lysate as the instant release growth factor, which immediately begins to help signal and help those cells do their job. And we use that, by the way, in non-bone uh, marrow procedures. But then on the other hand, um, you know, the uh, PRP, think of that as the more extended release, which actually is measured in weeks in terms of the growth factors, their impact on you and how they are able to help. So, all right. 
So we're getting close to the end here. We, these are great questions. I really appreciate you guys putting these in. Um, what typically is the duration of the response for uh, a stem cell slash PRP procedure for the knee and how frequently are repeat procedures required to maintain improvement or boost response? Again, you guys will probably, I sound like a broken record on this. It really depends on you as an individual patient. If you came in with a completely unstable knee and we come in and, and, and say, hey, I think I can help you. I think you're a candidate. We, we you know, move forward. You know, there's a lot of variables there that we have to um, consider because uh, I'll give you an example. I have patients that we help that haven't been active for a couple, you know, few years because they've been suffering from knee pain. But then they come in, we do the procedure, we get them moving, we get them really doing well. Well, and then they go out and 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 say go skiing and veil, and then they fall off the mountain, right? Well, that you know, uh, that that's uh, I, I think we'd all agree that wouldn't be a fair way, you know, to characterize uh, patients um, that had a quote unquote repeat procedure. If you're out living your life, enjoying the the benefits of feeling better, moving better, having a better functional knee joint. Um, I want you to go live your life and I don't want you to feel like you have to walk around in a bubble. That's kind of the point, right? Quality of life and getting out there and doing things that you love. So I'm going to say, yeah, absolutely. Let's get out there and do that. But, you know, is that going to lead to potentially some more wear and tear and some damage? Absolutely. And, and are we going to turn around and look at things again and say, yeah, should we consider doing another treatment? Absolutely. And, and those are just, the things that you deal with from an active lifestyle. So those of you out there that are that are doing that, I, you know, I'd say, you know, keep moving, keep doing what you're doing, and and don't be afraid necessarily, right? With with you know within reason, right? Um, I mentioned hang gliding. I don't have a lot of hang gliders in, in my practice, but I'm happy to treat them. But that that you know, <laughs> so but I, but I want to point out that merely being out there and doing those things puts you at some level of risk. And so, but we don't really consider that a repeat procedure. So when all things are going, you know, pretty typically our patients will go for years with a single treatment. We don't have to do PRP boosters. There are times where I will recommend them. And there are times where I will introduce another term here uh, called prolotherapy, where we'll actually work in and around the joint to support the ligaments and help structurally stabilize uh, that joint, uh, in particular the knee. And we do that frequently. And sometimes we just need a little booster, a little prolotherapy. We're, we're getting a, you know, a little unstable there and um, we can get you back on track. So um, we always try, again, try to be good stewards of resources uh, for our patients. And, and I don't really have anyone that I'm saying, look, you need to come in and have a bone marrow procedure you know, every year in order to make this work. It, there's just not any solid, you know, bulletproof data that says that that's what you need to do. Um, so, uh, however, we have extremely good data within the Regenix network and with the tens of thousands of procedures that we've done, that our approach is frankly, uh, uh, you know, among the best thing available that you can do non-surgically in terms of outcomes. So, all right. So, all right, last question, we're wrapping up and this is so, so appreciate who got this last question in. So any post-procedure precautions, restrictions, what is the typical follow-up schedule following uh, procedure? Okay, so if we're gonna talk, let's say we've been kind of on the theme of knee and bone on bone, your typical follow-up um, for this is gonna be, we, we'll typically see you at one week out from your procedure. Um, and uh, the overwhelming majority of patients are back to baseline pain. Um, or, or even potentially sometimes better, literally in a week, which is hard to imagine. Um, and but and they're also uh, uh, we're starting them in therapy within a week. So you're actively participating in therapy within a week of the procedure. You're able to get back to work, and certainly any sedentary things you're able to do um, in a week or less. Um, and then relative to um, your your follow up after that, we typically do a month follow up and you're staying in therapy, um, because of the nature of how we take care of our patients, we're always available. And I have times where patients will say, hey, I want you to take a look at it. I saw something, you know, and, and, and pop in, you know, at two weeks. We always uh, are there to support you um, along that trajectory. And then in terms of, um, 
you know, when we would release you to kind of full activity, that typically, depending on the case, you know, typical case, we're going to be in that six week uh, range, uh, if you will. Um, and again, you're, there's an opportunity for continued improvement that's measured in months, especially when you look at the outcomes data that's on the regenix.com site. And we see patients continuously improve in that three month, six month, nine month range, we're still seeing people improve. So, um, and, but in terms of, you know, is this going to be a factor in your day-to-day -day life? Uh, you know, I, I saw a patient today for a six month follow-up you know, and, and really, you know, we talked about everything else, but the knee, because it was doing so well. And she had advanced stage uh, disease in the knee. And, um, you know, we talked about it and said, okay, you know, you, you got a tough knee and, and, uh, but really you know, she couldn't be happier with the outcome for her knee. She's six months out, six months out. And, and frankly, we're, we're on to looking at other things, right. Uh, outside the knee. Um, and so um, that gives you a, a good sense. And right now, you know, uh, there's, there's really, uh, you know, we have a great opportunity to treat patients, uh, because we have so much data again, you know, you look at 16,000 patients, um, you know, that is, that is a, a wealth of data and, uh, to be able to understand how to approach these things with that level. And remember, Regenix is celebrating its 18th year in existence this year. So, all right. So we're, uh, wrapping up and, um, if you do have additional questions, I want you guys to, uh, that we didn't get to tonight and we got to some great ones, uh, we'd love for you to submit those. We'll include those in future webinars, but even better yet, why don't you call the number 405-697-3436, schedule an evaluation with us. And uh, I'd love to have an opportunity to educate you in person and really go into your specific issues and really help you understand why you know, frankly, bone on bone, I think we can agree at this point after the discussion, that's just a slang term that's thrown around so that, you know, that there's no more questions, right? You're going to surgery, right? If I give you that diagnosis, you're supposed to say, hey, when do I have surgery? But but it it really shouldn't be that way. And I think it's a it's a shortcut and, and it's a disservice, frankly, to patients because you never really understand what truly is wrong and what your true options are. And when someone tells you, hey, you don't have any other options, well, that's because they don't know how to provide you any other options, but that's what, what we do. And if you're talking to a surgeon, don't be surprised if they offer you surgery, right? That's kind of the way it goes. Um, and uh, But if you're, you're coming to see a, a surgery-free, non-surgical specialist like myself, uh, I've spent my entire career perfecting the skills to provide you with a viable non-surgical alternative. And I want to give you the opportunity to see, um, you know, if that may be a better fit for your life and, and uh, certainly gives you a low risk opportunity um, to explore how you can improve your day to day uh, quality of living and get you uh, out of pain and back to the life you deserve. Okay. All right. So thank you and uh, good night.